founded the series on the formation of stars and protostars. So now we're going to learn how low-mass stars like the Sun evolve with time. Stars change during their long lifespans. Their histories reveal how they evolve as they furiously use up their finite but enormous amount of fuel from the moment they're born. Let's look at exactly how they do that. First, one thing to remember is that almost all stars in the sky are really quite boring. Well, boring if you're looking for massive explosions as viewed from Earth. Most of the stars, which can be derided as insanely boring, are so name-called because ultimately they weigh in at less than half the mass of the Sun. They do some really boring stuff that we'll chat about at the end. After the vigor of the Sun, it'll only take one slide to explain them. Thus, 85% of all the stars in the Milky Way can be explained with one slide. After we're done talking about the Sun and these other puny things, we'll go into really more dramatic things like such as massive stars that populate the cosmos with heavy elements. But to be fair, there's an awful lot of research done on these tiny stars because they're so numerous that they might even be havens for exoplanets that might shelter life outside the solar system. So let's begin our journey into stellar evolution with how a star like the Sun changes with time. And so once again, let's start over with the life cycles of stars. This excellent infographic comes from the Chandra Group at Harvard. We see that the mass goes from the low mass stars at the bottom of the graph to the high mass stars along the top. We see how stars evolve as time progresses from left to right. Just like in the previous lectures on star birth, we see there's different flavors of protostars. The more massive the protostar, the shorter the time it takes for them to collapse down into a star, and they end up doing something very different. But we're getting out of ourselves. We're going to be talking about the bottom three tiers. At the bottom are the brown dwarfs, which don't really seem to do much during their lives. That's not entirely true. So what happens to brown dwarfs? If the protostar is less than 8% of the mass of the Sun, or 0.08 solar masses, this brown dwarf will never initiate fusion in its core. It simply contracts like a protostar under gravitational pressure, releasing heat via the Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism. We talked at length about this in my lecture on the Sun and in the Starbirth series. Amazingly, a brown dwarf will do that a very long time. It's the closest thing to forever for a brown dwarf to do its mellow thing. Brown dwarfs can also be called hot Jupiters, and there are a large number of massive exoplanets that have been found around other stars that are basically in the in-between zone of a planet and a star. These non-stellar objects make up a huge number of the objects in the Milky Way. Next, second level, we have the red dwarfs, which will eventually become white dwarfs. These live between 8% and 25% of the mass of the Sun. They do fusion in their core, with the least massive doing so just barely. But these just barely stars make up between 75 and 80% of all the stars in the Milky Way. We don't see them in the sky without telescopes, because they're far too dim. Next is the primary subject of this lecture. Looking at the third tier, the protostar becomes a sun-like star and then becomes a red giant and its closing epochs forms a planetary nebula and finally a white dwarf. We'll talk about some of the other stuff up above next time. We see that stars have cycles of birth, youth, middle age, decline, and death. So the source of life of nearly all stars is hydrogen fusion in their cores. Every star that you see in the night sky, and most you don't, is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core. However, many of the visibly brighter stars, such as Betelgeuse and Bellatrix, shine by fusing helium in their cores. But the question that concerns us today is what happens when a star's hydrogen is used up and converted into helium? Then what happens to the star after all this helium is created? Well, for stars like the Sun, the core is too cool to ignite helium fusion. And by hot, we mean, of course, that the helium nuclei in the core are not moving fast enough to have a decent chance of overcoming the Coulomb barrier and therefore quantum tunneling into close enough proximity to fuse. This all means that an inert helium core is slowly building up in the center of the Sun. The main sequence lifespan, which says the same thing as the length of time a star is burning hydrogen, is determined by how much hydrogen is available to fuse in the core. Throughout this chat, I'll loosely conflate the word burning with fusing. The hydrogen fusion or fusion bursting lifetime of a main sequence star like the Sun will last about 10 billion years. Such stars are about one solar mass. The little m circle dot means that is the unit of a solar mass. But if the star is just barely clocking in at a tenth of the mass of the Sun, then such a star can live up to about 10 trillion or 10 to the 13th years. 
This is an incredibly long time. The universe itself is only about 13.7 billion years old, which means that literally zero of all the stars in the 0.08 to about half solar mass have run out of hydrogen in their cores. Further, these are all red dwarfs. They are the dimmest and most common stars of all. So the evolutionary cycle of the Sun follows the graphic across the top. For about 10 or 11 billion years, the Sun is a main sequence star. Then for about one and a quarter billion years, it's a red giant, where it grows to be roughly the size of Earth's or Mars's orbit. Then it becomes a horizontal branch, red giant star, for about a hundred million years, in which it's stably burning helium. As it runs out of helium, it rises in luminosity to become an asymptotic giant branch star for about 20 million years. At this point, the helium has run out and it sputters like a car with an empty tank and pulses itself apart over about a half a million years with the outer envelope all becoming a planetary nebula, which dissipates away after about 10,000 years. At the end of this lifespan, it will be a white dwarf. This white dwarf will only have about half the Sun's original mass. All the rest will go out into space and enrich the interstellar medium with carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and, of course, hydrogen and helium. Right now, the Sun is about 4.5 billion years into its main sequence life of approximately 11 billion years. Amazingly, we know this because of the ages of carbonaceous meteorites with chondrules and calcium aluminum inclusions that date them at 4.567 billion years old. CAIs are 30 million years older than the Earth and about 140 million years older than the oldest rocks known on Earth. The Earth, Sun, and all the planets form from the same nebula and such meteorites solidified directly from that nebula and live far enough from the Sun to never melt. Anyway, let's look at the age of the Sun. In the center of the Sun right now, the core is burning hydrogen. This is the fusion of hydrogen into helium via the proton-proton chain process. This is possible because it's roughly 15 million Kelvin in the core. If it was a little hotter, perhaps 18 million Kelvin, then the Sun would be burning hydrogen through the CNO cycle. As it stands, the Sun only gets about 2% of its energy from the CNO cycle. I discussed this at length in my video about what's going on inside the Sun's core. Stars like the Sun will do this for about 11 billion years. The current structure of the Sun at 4.567 billion years old, it has an inert helium core down in the center. This helium is the hot ember of the hydrogen fusion that's already occurred. As hydrogen burns to helium, it sinks to the center and doesn't participate in anything at all. In fact, it's getting more and more compressed as time goes on, growing in its degeneracy. The core is completely composed of helium. Surrounding this inert core is a hydrogen burning zone that's still part of the core. This energy transport mechanism of the core region is purely radiative, which I've indicated with the reddish zone. The blue fusion core is also radiative support. That zone is where the fusion occurs. This merges pretty smoothly with the convective zone above it, and it's important to note that the sun's core does not mix with the convective zone. The convection does not go deep enough. What's down in the core stays in the core. Of course, at the top of the convective zone, that's where we see granules and supergranules and the photosphere, as well as all the active regions on the surface, what we call the surface of the Sun. When the star starts to run out of hydrogen, that's when it leaves the main sequence. Before then, during the main sequence life, two things are always in balance. One, there's a gravitational pull that's pulling the star together, which is balanced by the outward pressure due to the heat coming from the center. Remembering our ninth grade chemistry class, if you have an ideal gas that heats up a little bit, then the gas will expand. Once this gas has expanded to accept the additional heat, if it can radiate away this heat, it'll contract again. For a star, the source of this heat is fusion, and a star can expand since it is gaseous and not a solid or liquid. If a star expands due to additional heat from the core, then that relieves the pressure allowing the core to cool. This in turn means less heat is generated, and this means gravity starts to win and contracts the gas as it cools. Gravity wins until fusion kicks back in with enough energy to expand the gas above the core again. In this way, there's a continual battle between the inward pressure due to a star's self-gravitation and the outward pressure due to the heat provided by the fusion in the core. After a star is settled onto the main sequence after its protostellar phase, this balance is very good. So good, we don't see the sun pulsing radially. The energy output from the core exactly matches the energy lost to space. We call this balance of energy supplied to energy lost thermodynamic equilibrium. Also, 
We call the lack of pulsation due to the balancing of outward gas pressures against the self-gravity of the star hydrostatic equilibrium. On the main sequence, these two equilibria hold true. But when the core starts to run out of fuel, then both balances begin to break down and the star leaves the main sequence.